Hato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the holy one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Guess who's back? I'll just read uh, the topic, how to discuss the benefits of twin practice and uh, change in behavior without using Buddhist jargon. But we can use Buddhist terms or Buddhist uh, kind of uh, uh, Pali words. It is like uh, how to uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, your practice, your benefits. That is uh, what the discussion is about. Okay, sister. Yeah, the, um, the, the puppy has to get his words in. <laughs> the puppy has to bark. Okay. okay. Um, when this came about because um, someone came to me and said, well, for instance, if I'm very advanced in my practice, and for instance, my uh, personality is shifting a little bit. And <clears throat> how do we shift our personality is we get often quieter and we get we like to be more alone sometimes be alone more often. <clears throat> and, and the um, and the issue for this person basically was her family's not Buddhist. And the issue has been with her friends also, many of them are not Buddhist. So uh, she um, doesn't really, she's tried a few times of addressing this, but as soon as she starts to actually talk about uh, Buddhism, there's a hush in the room and a lot of questions come back and all of that. And she said, I don't know what to do. She said, I don't know how to talk to people about what it is I'm doing. And so the question is, do we really have to communicate to people who are outside of Buddhism when we're discussing our, uh, uh, you know, what's happening for us and what this is all about? Do we really have to discuss it in terms of Buddhism? Can we be discussing it in neutral ground since this is a teaching which is universal and is not for Buddhists, it's for humanity there were no Buddhists in the time of the Buddha. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic. And I've uh, run into it myself because in the beginning, early on, uh, and this is like back in 2000, when I started to get involved with this, I come from a family, uh, some of whom were in churches and went to study churches for many, many years. And I went to different churches over the years and was this Christ involved in Christianity one way or another for over oh, almost 50 years. And so uh, a question is why on earth would you become a Buddhist? But it isn't about with why I became a Buddhist as much as my life story of having difficulties and having a very interesting life that was very broad spectrum with drama, 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 <laughs> and, and, and really wanting to understand desperately as a teenager and growing up what in the world is happening to me? Why is this happening to me? How come this happens to me? Replayed again and again. And when I found Buddhism, um, there was an answer. And I learned that answer. And as I learned that answer, it became clear to me that if I really learned this answer strongly enough, clearly enough, well enough, I would be able to help other people understand there was an answer, how things work. And I would be able to uncover some of the things that really make the biggest difference, that everything is in an, an impersonal nature that we are experiencing in this world. And so one of the answers, one of the ways that we can talk about this, it's actually a good time to be talking about what we're looking into and everything. Why? because of cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science. That's why. And because every the way that things have been uncovered, that's one of the reasons we are able to speak about 
the, the workings of Buddhism and what makes you free from suffering, what helps you to get free from suffering, okay? Uh, but also the commonality that exists within Christianity and actually many other religions. There's a, there are common strings here that you can talk about without saying this is Buddhist. There is a moral string, there is an ethics string, uh, there is uh, the many suttas that have things in them without talking about it being a sutta. If you took like, I give you some suggestions here for this angle of it, um, but if you took number four, the Bayabharawa Sutta, and you were look, to look at that, you would say to yourself, um, you know, is that sutta uh, of value to just anyone, the one about fear and dread? And it's, of course it is. And it's a whole, it's a whole, um, um, a whole story of <clears throat> handling fear and dread about anything. And it has in it, in the sutta, it actually has uh, 17 different pieces on just the second page. It runs from section, I think it's from section four, or five, from four, all the way down to section 19. And the things in here are, for instance, practicing the opposite. So if you're in trouble with a lot of lust, you would practice not having lust or not being covetous and go in the opposite direction. So this, this lessons in Christianity, this lessons in the Jewish faith, this lesson is in a lot of different faiths, okay? And so we find this string. If you were a person who had sloth and torpor, you would raise your energy and work outside of sloth and torpor. If you had a lot of thoughts of hate, you would Level, balance this out by the opposite, which is practicing for the day, a mind of loving kindness. If you have restlessness and unpeaceful mind, you would decide an affirmation, set up an affirmation and talk about a peace, living with a peaceful mind. Are you uncertain and doubting? And then go beyond that, get curious and go beyond doubt for the day. That's being open for possibilities, being open to possibilities of something else when you're doubting something, that something else could be the way also. Given to self-praise and disparagement of others, then you would practice not being, uh, not being given to self-praise or disparagement of others. If you're subject to fear and alarm and terror, you would practice being free from trepidations. This whole thing, if you go and look at it, that one is a really good one, just as a subject of discussion. Now, another one that we were uh, teaching a Christian community back in, I think, mm, gosh, <clears throat> 2005, 2006, 2007, maybe like that, for a couple of years, a few years we were going down there. And if you go back to 95, the Chanki Sutta, and you look at the Chanki Sutta, the group of people we were teaching were not really um, particularly practicing that much, okay? They weren't practicing so much. But the thing about it was they were fascinated with the information that was coming and how in the Dhamma talks that Bhante was giving, they were interested in the material and it, how to use it in life. And they kept coming. There was about 25 or 30 of them. They kept coming and coming because they wanted to hear him talk about the things that were so useful in life. And the Chanki Sutta is remarkable because the Chanki Sutta takes you through a whole set of information explaining to you the 12 points of how you can succeed if you are practicing and developing something or learning a subject and you want to be an expert, things like that. So you follow a line of development in the teacher-student relationship, okay? You have put your faith in the teacher. That's the first one. You can write these down. You put your faith in the teacher. And in order, the best thing to do about that is start visiting the teacher. So you visit the teacher, visiting it is most, most, uh, most helpful. I actually do this the way, he, the way it came and it was given originally. First, let's see, 
we go through these really careful. You have the subject and what you're doing is striving to learn the subject. And the thing that is most helpful to get to the final arrival of truth in your subject is that's uh, is is to strive and to scrutinize. So scrutiny becomes the thing that is most supportive, most helpful for striving. And when you want to know what is most helpful, the next thing is application of will is most helpful for scrutiny. So scrutinizing what you learn, you learn it, you write it down. Now you have to scrutinize it, make sure you understand it. Then you apply your will to scrutinizing. And then the next one is enthusiasm is the most important application for uh, application to support the application of, of will. The enthusiasm in the subject, the interest in the subject. This is where Bonte's always saying, choose something that you like in life and then go work in that direction and you will be happy because you love what you do and you are doing what you love. And that makes it so it's great for you in life. You find different ways to do it. <clears throat> I had a man, a young man who wanted to be in the airline industry and they, would, they couldn't let him fly. He had all the credentials and all the courses passed, but he couldn't let him fly passengers yet because he was too young. But they brought him into the industry in another door until he was old enough to fly. And he spent two and a half years before he even started flying, two or three years in the industry. <laughs> so it's up to you. You can do it with determination and you'll try to do it with determination if you find something you like and you think you can do that for life. That's what you should go for. So a reflective acceptance of the teachings in the subject that you're learning is the most supportive thing for this enthusiasm. And that is the most important uh, thing that is helping the enthusiasm. The next one is examination of the meaning and examination of the meaning is most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teaching you're being given. Okay. And then the next one, let's see what it is. Yeah. Memorizing the teachings is the next one that is the most supportive thing for examining the teaching, examination of the teachings. So what does it mean for memorization in Buddhism, by the way? It doesn't mean you go, you have to go and start memorizing uh, suttas. It doesn't really mean that. It could be just memorizing by memorizing the five aggregates, three kinds of feeling, uh, six sense doors, and then the first line of, of of direct practice, the dana, the sila, and the bhavana, these kind of things. That's even memorization. So you have hearing the dhamma, and the hearing the dhamma is the most important thing to support the memorization of the teachings because you hear it. And in order to hear it properly, the next one is giving ear. And giving ear means everything else leaves your mind. Everything leaves your mind the past, the future, you're here in the present time and you listen to the Dharma and that is giving ear the right way. Then paying respect, paying respect is supportive of uh, the most important thing to, to help you to give ear, You paying respect, the most helpful thing is, uh, oops, let's see, I'm going backwards on this, so it's a little bit hard. Paying respect is helpful for giving ear, okay? And then visiting the teacher, you have to visit the teacher to pay respect to them, and that's the most supportive thing for paying respect. And then before you're visiting them, you have to have faith that something is there. Now, they took this, this Christian group, they took it, and they turned it into a program for freshmen in a university in the Bible Belt, 
okay, and used it for the orientation program. One of the professors, it was his turn for bringing in the freshmen and used this as sort of a guidepost for how the university would like their students to operate. So you see the application is there. So this is very familiar territory too. So 95 is a very useful sutta for this kind of thing. The next one, let's see the next one, I should have to say 62, you should remember 62. <clears throat> now 62 is the Maha Rahulavada Sutta and this Maha Rahulavada Sutta is an important lesson for us with the Brahma Viharas. And even the Brahma Viharas themselves, if you're practicing twim and you are practicing the Brahma Viharas, what are you practicing? You are practicing loving kindness. You're practicing compassion. You are practicing being joyful and spreading joy for other people and seeing them be happy too and be joyful because they're happy. All this kinds of wonderful, joyful part. Yeah. And then the last one is um, equanimity. And the equanimity is necessary in everything we do in life right now. Everything. It is helpful in all your occupations. It is helpful at school. It is helpful to breed it in your family, to be talking about it and building it up and using it with children in all types of things and games and everything. But all families need a basis of equanimity and balance. And so does your community. So does your town. So does your city. So does your country. Okay, here, in section 18, um, you will find from 18 to 21, the four parts of the Brahma Viharas. And so why are they so, why do they cross over between everything that's going on with humanity? It doesn't matter what faith or how you live, why is it so useful? Is basically because when you're thinking something in your mind, your mind can only do one thing at a time. And when, you are thinking loving kindness and you've decided for the day you're going to live with loving kindness. Well, then you cannot have any thoughts of ill will come up. They can't come up. They get canceled out by the frequency that is there with the loving kindness is a much higher frequency than the negative side. Also, when you are practicing compassion it changes to compassion and you're practicing compassion, then you can have no thoughts of cruelty they will be abandoned. Any thoughts of cruelty will just fall away. They won't be coming up. And then the Buddha said to his son, Rahula, develop meditation on altruistic joy. For when you develop meditation on altruistic joy, any discontent will be abandoned. So when you really have altruistic joy, some people like to say sympathetic joy, but it really, I've experienced it as altruistic joy. And it was kind of surprising. All of a sudden, I was so happy when I was going through that level when somebody else had something really great happen to them. If you've ever had that experience, that means that you have experienced altruistic joy because it's a joy that comes up from what the other person has done instead of you. And so, the next one is the meditation on equanimity. And when you meditate on equanimity, any aversion to anything doesn't come up in your mind. Not when you're into equanimity. I just had a student contact me and say, what is this? I'm not reacting to anything that's upsetting for anybody in my house. And usually I get upset, but I'm sitting here observing and it's not touching me. What is that? What is that? That is an experience of a deeper level of equanimity. That's what it is. Nothing's wrong with you. It's just that you've been practicing in that direction and it was a natural evolutionary thing. So always remember that just a simple, the simplest thing is breath meditation and breath meditation teaching anyone, you know, in the emergency room in the hospital, when someone comes in with an accident, I have watched in the bay of emergency rooms 
when I was working as a staffing coordinator with another staffing director and watching how they use um, this in, um, in emergency situations, everybody calms down. If you just, uh, okay, take a breath, take a breath in the middle of an accident, if you're there helping people and somebody's getting very upset, you hold them, you look right at them and say, take a breath, the rhythm of your breath, the rhythm with the universe, breathe with me, breathe, breathe with me. You see the breath was the calming, immediate calming down. The immediate coming down when you came into the forest to the old monk and you said, I want you to teach me meditation. First thing he does is he teaches you breathing meditation at the door. That's the first one you're going to practice because he wants you to calm down from the city you run away from or from whatever upsetting situation it was. He wants you calm down. That's where you steady yourself down. The very first meditation I did with Bhante V. Ramsey was breathing meditation. He only kept me using it for about two weeks when he saw how it was sort of like a duck that got in water and I was <laughs> really happy with it. But the thing I remember most was going out of the city uh, of Washington, D.C. into the temple. And the first time I ever sat, I went back to the apartment where I was staying. And that night I slept like my niece and nephew would sleep, these little children would go to sleep, dead to the world, didn't move, didn't dream, wasn't disturbed at all, hadn't slept in that way in many years, many years. <clears throat> and so calming down, it has the effect of calming you down right away. And we had done it for about an hour each time. There was two or three nights in the beginning, they had done it. All those times we did that, I could go right to sleep. And then as I was going along, I learned that gradually the what we're doing, what is the teaching that we're, we're teaching you? What exactly are we teaching you about? Now, some of you know, some of you are new here, I think, but some of you know, I went and I taught some Catholic nuns. And when I taught those Catholic nuns in a convent to uh, do deeper personal prayer, I wasn't teaching them uh, in a Buddhist manner. I wasn't doing it. It was a challenge and I wanted to do it because I had thought about it for many years. I had thought, is this really a universal thing that can be taught where somebody will not be afraid of me if I'm looking like this and I am in my robes and I go to teach a group of people about prayer or something, are they gonna be, am I gonna be able to do this comfortably or are they gonna block me? Are they gonna block me? So. I'll tell you what happened with that retreat. When I got there, I was very much ready to do the first night to do a, um, a Christian style meditation with them. But when I got there, I saw their faces. <laughs> and I could tell right away something else had to happen here because we needed to get onto common ground, very common ground, very quickly. And so what I did was, um, and this is not necessarily a conversation. I mean, you, you might do it with somebody who's interested in the history of the church and the history of religion and all that. But what I did it with them, because I wanted very fast common ground. So I put the Ten Commandments on one side and I put the precepts on the other side of a board. And the fact is that if you look at them very carefully, there are nine precepts we have among those five, they can be divided out into nine pieces. And the only one that's really not there is depending on a higher power to take care of us for any work that we're doing to help ourselves in this life, because Buddhism is not set up that way. That's all. We, we, we fill in, we, we are happy with all those uh, pieces, but ours are not commandments. They are a set of, a set of advice for how we operate very well in our lifetime when we are living our life, okay? And it's up to us if we keep them or not, but we are expected to test everything if we are following what the Buddha is teaching. He's expecting us to ask questions continually. He's expecting us, uh, that is, that's over in uh, Majima Nikaya number 135, 
if you want to know where that is, because he's expecting us when he explains karma, he's expecting us to understand if we keep asking questions in this lifetime and we have to come back and come through again, we would like to be smart and we would like to be have wisdom and that if we're asking questions in this life, that's probably how it will be if we have to come in again. But it's the healthiest thing for us to keep asking questions. And it's very healthy to understand there is no such thing as a stupid question or an odd question or don't ask that question. Go on and ask the questions. Because from the perspective you have of a question, someone else might have a different uh, uh, you know, perspective or angle of looking at it and get something out of it you don't even expect. So in the... Um, it is in section 20. Is that right? Wait, wait, yeah, right. I'm sorry. Sutta number 135. Mm -hmm. And it is in section, read from section 17 down through 20. And you will find the part about how important it is to ask questions and what will happen to you in the next life. So the, the, um, the areas that I mentioned number four, I mentioned 95. Um, I know there's some guidance in 15 and there's there, you're gonna find them in a lot of other places. If you start looking at these things a little bit different from a different angle, when you start going through these, you're going to find a lot of different places where it's, um, there are simple pieces that you can simply not, there, you can discuss them and discuss the topic, but it's not Buddhist. It's not, it's universal. It's humanistic. That's what's the point I'm trying to make here. So if we look at the kind of training that we're having, let's look at that for a minute. So we have Dana and Sheila and Bhavana first. In the traditional way, you come into the Buddhist school of, of meditation and the monks are gonna invite you in and teach you all the basics and give you your bowl and your robes. And even if you're an average person coming in, they're still gonna teach you this line of order here. They're gonna teach you generosity first. And why are they gonna teach you generosity? You're going to teach you generosity because you'll feel better about everything. Because generosity will open, open your heart, soften your heart and open your heart. That is part of the purpose of gen practicing generosity. It's generosity to yourself. It's generosity to everybody immediately around you. In the case of the monks, everybody in that group of monks or in the meditation school where you are. And some monks told me they did that with people for about two weeks before they started any order, really orderly uh, type of training, except for light breathing, but they didn't go into it much. The whole point was, can you get along with living with other people? Can you be generous and selfless and let people help people and live together like, uh, like blending like milk and water instead of like oil and water, okay? It talks about that in um, in Majima Nikaya number 128. In the beginning part of the suit, it talks about how the monks were living together in that place uh, before it gets into talking about uh, hindrances. And so the first thing is this generosity is all through most religions. It's there. The generosity to other people and helping other people is there, the goodness part. And... Um, then you have the Sheila and our Sheila, the Sheila is, as I said, it's balanced and that's balanced with Judaism, balanced with Islam, you know, with Hindu all the way through of the care of yourself and the care of, uh, for other people. And then, and then you go to Bhavana. Now the Bhavana in this first three line of Dana Sheila Bhavana, the Bhavana is the development of what? It is the development of the generosity. It is the development of keeping your precepts and starting to smile more because things are working better for you and discovering that and practicing the two of them together, continuing to do that is what the 
Sheila is composed of in the next three. So then you have Sheila Samadhi Panya, the Sheila is Dana and Sheila Dana and she, uh, the precepts together in that Sheila. And it continues to extend out to the world. Samadhi, Samadhi is tranquil wisdom. Samata, Sama, and D is a root piece for the word wisdom. So the um, tranquil wisdom is where the name tranquil wisdom insight meditation comes from. Sila Samadhi and Panya. Panya is of two types. The Panya, you are practicing in your practice yourself as you're developing in Buddhist in, in Buddhist teachings, learning two things, learning meditation. It's a parallel teaching, meditation, and, um, and the Dhamma. So the Dhamma you learn in this, in this piece, that is, that is learned parallel to each other, means happening at the same time. And when those two trainings are happening, this we can relate to people also, being balanced in the knowledge of what you're doing and then taking that Dhamma and applying it in your meditation and then applying it outwards in life, it makes a difference for you. The difference that happens for us in our training is a reflection of the other face wanting to have us the same thing happen for the human being. This is not different, it's not so different. Um, it's, it's traveling the same path as what I'm trying to get you to understand. And um, so I wanna, I want you to ask questions now, just think for a minute in a particular way for me. I want you to think about it and say, what was a hard time for you to explain to someone outside Buddhism? Have you had that experience? Tell me what it was that happened. Tell me, just tell me where you had that happen, that it was difficult for you. And we could listen to that and let's talk about what can that person do? What can that person do to talk about what's going on for them? So who'd like to be first? <laughs> I really want you to take a turn on this. Sarma, do you have one? Did you ever try to talk to somebody about Buddhism who isn't a Buddhist? Does it happen? <laughs> you know, I was pulling you in to get, you know, this was a uh, interactive talk. I should have told you ahead of time. <laughs> How about Sujata? Have you ever had a time where you had this problem where you discussing what you're doing with your parents or friends or anything like that? See, one of the angles of talking to people about what we're, what we're learning in Buddhism is to step over and say what's actually happening with the human being and talk from that angle. Okay, so what do I mean? Cognitive psychology, neurocognitive science is looking at how the human being cognizes or understands what's happening in life how do they come to the conclusion nothing is happening to us? Everything is happening from us. But how we decide that we look at the situation, how do we, we decide, determine what we're going to do? That's what uh, this is about. So Ulysses, are you alive? <laughs> are you there? <laughs> there is one question uh, which uh, uh, 
I think uh, Sarah has asked. Uh, so I'll just paraphrase the question she's asked. Uh, she's saying that, uh, see, uh, this is about uh, uh, communication with the family. So if there are certain uh, family members who listen to you uh, about your experiences are kind of uh, uh, giving you ear and uh, are happy for you. But there are other family members who uh, don't want to listen. Uh, they don't want to know what you are doing. So how do you keep balance in this situation? And how do you communicate with them uh, 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 in the family? Kind of there are uh, many who would accept their situation, uh, many who would not. So that is the question. One of the things is, do we really have to have everybody know what we're doing? Is it us feeling like we have to have everybody know what we're doing? If they don't want to know what we're doing, do we need to make them understand what we're doing? We really don't. Okay. We just need to be using loving and kindness and forgiving them. If they don't, if they don't want to listen, that's their position. They don't want to hear that's fine. The other end of this is when a person gets pressured, what are you doing? And you have, you find yourself in a position as a Hindu, as a Jew, as a Muslim, as something else. Okay. A Christian. And you want to tell the person, this isn't harming me. This is all about learning how the brain is actually running. The mind is the, the control center for the whole body and everything we, we go through in life. And it's a close examination of how everything works and the true nature of everything. This is what it really is. So it isn't against anything else. You're actually, I have been lately saying, uh, to people who just want to know what is happening here, what are you doing? We, we are opening a communication system that has always been inside the human being so that we our intentions can carry through into our actions. And that's what seems to change our life. We, we making, making our, uh, helping our mind to understand if we have an intention, please follow the intention in the direction I want to go. So that means if I have an intention to do good or an intention for loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness, uh, help me to go in, in that direction. And I have the intention you're saying to the mind, support me. And you're actually talking about neuroscience is what you're doing. You're talking about human cognition. It's a science. It's not a threat to anybody or anything or any religion other than Buddhism. Buddhism, to me, I have always said this ever since I came into this, Buddhism is like an accidental religion. It's an accident, okay? Because it was never meant to actually become a dogma of any kind, you know? And the reason it became a, a religion was because when you really look at what you're doing, it's mostly scientific and psychological. And when the Buddhist exits, when his parinibbana happens, Ananda and the others are left with a big amount of information, and there's no science institute to drop it off at. The only way that it can survive is by having the group as a set of monastics or monks to preserve it. And that's how it was preserved. So it ends up being turning into uh, all the celebrations that you have are reminders of the story and reminders of the, uh, the actual teaching parts as you go along through the year when you look at that. But it's not a threat to anybody, you see? So the, the idea is, is, can we discuss it peacefully? Can we show you what it is without it having to be Buddhist? Can you understand it in terms of relieving the suffering of someone who is overwhelmed with grief, oh, completely overrun and dis dysfunctional with grief by helping them to understand what is grief? How does it happen? How does it work? Will it ever end? And these answers are there and how to handle it and how to get through it properly so that it will begin to gradually fade away at its own pace, anywhere from a month to three years or four years, but it, at its own pace. And it's okay. 
these things, these are the pieces of that. You see how it works. Um, I probably, in order to do a really good talk about this, I don't know if I actually want to put this one up or not, but to really do it right, we should have you all write in questions because then it puts me on a track where I can really say, this is a good way, this is a good way, this is a good way of maybe approaching on that particular topic. I'm not sure if I, if I did this quite right, you know, because I really thought there, this room would be really, really crowded. <laughs> Because maybe that's maybe we need to approach it a little differently. You need to tell me what you think. But the thing is, it's crossing the line of what do we have here? It's very difficult to discuss Christianity without actually without um, Christ in it, without the whole event in it and the whole structure that is there. It's difficult to explain that to someone without that. You see, Buddhism doesn't have this, this issue, you know, because it is, um, it's a psychological release. It's a, it's a solution for um, a way of approaching by countering greed, hatred, and delusion, by steering in another direction, by uh, following the buildup of generosity and and of, of the morality, but not because someone says you have to, or I'm going to strike you dead. It's just advice. And he's basically saying he's watched in hundreds of thousands of lifetimes, how it works. This is how it works. It's a good idea to stay on this side of things instead of the other side of things. You don't want to do that. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, you know, to to actually put this together, Monty, mm -hmm. without having uh, having had, had collected a bunch of questions. I didn't really think about that. Rahul, what do you think about it? Somebody write. You know, you can write on the chat. That's okay. You can write on the chat. Certainly. Uh, so, uh, uh, what the, uh, we were kind of discussing about was that uh, if there is a there are certain family members who are uh, kind of not uh, agreeing with you and certain uh, who are agreeing with you, how to keep the balance? So, as you have explained that uh, you have to keep uh, uh, the, the the those family members who are uh, not kind of agreeing with you, uh, you don't have to kind of uh, tell them what you are doing in total. You have to kind of uh, send them loving kindness and be uh, kind to them. And uh, also uh, you have to say that uh, you are not, uh, whatever you are doing is not hurting anybody or what, what your uh, religion is or whatever your belief system is. But it is a way of understanding our mind, uh, of understanding our uh, actions. Uh, uh, it is a personal uh, practice for enhancing our uh, understanding. It is not a practice where it uh, threatens anybody else. See, one That's thing right. about this whole thing is it really important to have people agree with you. Why? And this is this is a higher way of looking at things. Do I have to have you agree with me? No, because every human being on the face of the earth through their life at some point will look at a spiritual path. They will look at spirituality and they will look at a spiritual path or be working to find something. And they're trying, what are they trying to find? They're trying to find peace. They're trying to figure out how everything works and they want answers. They do not want to just parrot things back and forth. Uh, you know, they don't want to just do that but they want to have real answers about how things work. And this is what you're interested in and studying it as a science, as a science for what happens to human beings, to their minds and bodies going through life. This is a remarkable journey, remarkable. When you consider if I'm sending loving kindness, is this religious or is it scientific? When I send loving kindness, no thoughts of ill will can arise. Well, they proved it in neuroscience, okay? When you are using compassion, when you, your compassion comes up and you are being 
you know, thinking compassion all the time and sending that to people around you, that's good and it's uplifting, it's helping people. But whether someone believes it is or not, do they have to believe me? No, but they should try it themselves. Smiling all day and keeping yourself, helping yourself, the more you do smile to help the meditation, the more easy it is for smiles to come up. And to say, I don't need you to agree with me. I really don't. This is the way path that I want to investigate. And I certainly respect your way of investigating a spiritual path. All I'm saying is, this is my investigation. This is what I want to do right now. See, now, if you're in a family, is it necessary for everybody in the family to agree with what you're going to do, with what you have to do? I know sometimes in India that gets tough. <laughs> I know uh, sometimes uh, women, for instance, want to go to school and they want to build a business and they want to take their time and their family thinks, well, she needs to be married right now. Look at her, her age. She's got to get married right now. I know that goes on, <laughs> but um, that's just the way it, it's still here. And it's going, it's going to have to work its way through eventually because here this brain and Sarma's brain and Bunty's brain were basically the same, <laughs> you know? And there could be good ideas in this one or good ideas in yours and good ideas in his sort of thing. That's an interesting part, yeah? But, but mm -hmm. go ahead. One more thing, uh, 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 I think uh, Paul was asking uh, that, uh, uh, are we doing a series about uh, the who dies at the book? So I'm sorry, the what? The who dies. The book uh, is there, uh, no? Uh, uh, that is Levine. Oh. Well, you know, the thing is, we were talking about that about three weeks or four weeks back. Nobody responded. I kept asking people to respond to me and tell me what you want to do with this. If you want to do that, we, we can look at that. I will tell you when I got into that book, it is, um, well, it has a, good, a lot of good advice in it. What you need to do is pick the advice and work the advice. It definitely coming from a Christian background, but it, it's universal. Most of the advice is universal. The way they look at how to do things. Yeah. So I need to hear from people. This is the dilemma I'm in right now. I'm in this place where if you don't write to me and say, you know, can we do this? Can we do that? Et cetera. And so forth. I need to hear from people. And if they write me and would tell me what they really want to do, I'm happy to provide it. See, I'm, nothing is locked in stone. And I enjoy finding out what you need to have me want to know for this or that angle of this May or that. has uh, sent some topics for Sunday, uh, this thing, classes. So yeah, that's a very interesting thing. May sent a request. One request was going through 95 uh, closely and 15 and looking at that, those two suttas as the, the helpful stuff that is in there for you to use outside in outside life, you know, in anything you're doing. And I pointed to 95, to the 12 pieces that are there in the story. And I also mentioned to you, but that's not what she means. She means actually reading 95 and then uh, going through 15, which is very short, but it's just a, a, a uh, it's a examination, close examination of um, actually who a teacher should be teaching and who we shouldn't take time to be teaching. And the reason that was put there, uh, I was told by some senior monks, was to help monks remember don't get caught with somebody that you're trying to train and you really want to help them, but they cannot get out of being caught by three or four of the things that are the negative ones. And they refuse to turn over to a new way of looking at things. And if that's the case, it's okay to say, I'm sorry, I can't teach you anymore. You need to find someone else that will, will um, teach you you know, because that it's is not just a topic perfect. we can explore in yeah. the future. We can explore and that I think, as a full talk yeah. or something like that. Huh? 
Yeah, because a lot of people, they don't believe that the Buddha ever would ever turn anybody away. And the Buddha probably had, let's say he probably had eternal patience, <laughs> probably. And in, in, in light of him, maybe that's true, but he knew that the monks would be faced with this. So he listed all the things that can really be kind of a killer <laughs> between the teacher and the student. If the teacher's trying to show the student how to do the practice and get the results. And in our practice, this really does matter. You know, I, I, had, a, I had a student two months ago, I had a student uh, or three months back I had a student, no matter what I did, no matter how many times I told them, there are these pieces in the steps you have to do, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return. You got to do it that way. You just can't say something came up and I threw it away and came straight back. Or you can't say I something came up and I um, what I did was I let, I let go of it, smiled and came back. You didn't relax. And the, and the issue, I was going to say this in another class, I was working with the, the, the you know, the inner part of the practice and what, what absolutely has to be there. And that relaxed step has to be there. It has to be there because it's something you can't, they'll say, I can't see anything left. Of course you can't. And if you were practicing many different types of things, you absolutely can't see what's left when you release that there's anything left but the release is not the release and the relax that is not the case so you know how uh, if you see something if you were doing something think about this for a minute if you were doing something and then you suddenly um your attention got caught and you moved to that at that point you'd be sort of holding your breath to get there and then if you released that you're still holding your breath, sort of, still a little tiny laugh. And the release step, I really think, is nothing more than you, you let go here. And the release step, you're still holding your breath. And you go, oh, and then you keep go back. You go back. You smile and go back. And the smile, the arguments I get about the smile are really funny. I don't feel like smiling. <laughs> it's the biggest, the big, biggest one is, but I don't feel like smiling. And yet in the instructions, there's nothing that says you have to feel like smiling. It isn't anything about smiling. This smile is as important to you as if you're riding a bike and you decide, I don't want to pedal anymore. <laughs> then the bike isn't going to keep going. Okay, <laughs> It's that simple. This is an operational step, the way this is working. So when I tell you to smile, you don't have to feel like smiling. It's nothing to do with that. Your smile, just tightening right here, is to do with this, this muscle running right here, up the side of your nose and right up here in, in your eyes, behind your nose bone the the, uh, the nostril bone, okay, it runs into your brain, and it helps to release these two pieces of the brain. So they'll separate slightly and release the pressure on the pineal gland. Bingo. Release the pressure on the pineal gland allows the endorphins to flow from the pineal gland. Those are the um, right. Those are the uh, chemicals that come from the endorphin. The endorphins are the chemicals that come and they make the mind lighten up and they help this open up. And that's what is the precursor for uplifted joy. So when you're smiling, that's why uplifted joy happens so quickly in the practice. You see, this isn't a mumbo jumbo. This is not a magic magic no, no, this is a physical reality. So do I have to be happy to go like that? Do I? No, but I feel much better. I feel lighter and open when I do. So this is a step involved in the mechanics of the meditation. So when the person comes in there totally unjustified because they just didn't listen and they might go through half of a retreat doing that to you and you just have to keep going with them until they finally figure out, oh yeah, you know that, sm that smile, it actually did something. 
<laughs> and you go, that's right. Yeah, it did. You see? Yes. So, okay, then uh, is there any other questions? No, you sure? <laughs> Ulysses, are you there? You got a question about this? It must be uh, uh, very early for you, Ulysses, no? Or that? Eight o'clock in the morning. Actually, he might have already been on this. Uh, he might have been on the subway and not be able to answer, or he might not be able to talk because they're, he's going over to the school. So shall we uh, close it now? Okay, shall we close the session? So okay. write a note if you have a topic you, you want to talk about regarding this. We're going to have to figure out another way to approach this, I think. Okay. okay. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. May all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.